How does a bad movie get 220 awards nominations? I would rather stand my ground and shoot each man in the heart and bury him in a pit than flee. White middle class liberal feminist American women talking, or women talking for short, is a movie in which white middle class liberal feminist American women dress up like Mennonite women and discuss the evils of men for one and a half hours. We will be forced to leave the colony if we don't forgive the men. We have been preyed upon like animals. Even the animals are safer in their homes than we women are. What if the men refuse to meet our demands? We'll kill them. We could ask the men to leave. None of us have ever asked the men for anything. Our freedom and safety are the ultimate goals. And it is men who prevent us from achieving those goals. It is one of the most boring movies I have ever watched and a political diatribe of such venomous, vitriolic hatred against men that it makes Gillette look like a men's rights advocacy group. Bullying. The Me Too violence, movement against toxic sexual harassment. Masculinity. Women Talking had a brief moment of cultural prominence when it was nominated for Best Picture at the 2023 Academy Awards and ended up winning Best Adapted Screenplay. Now, before I get into the evils of Women Talking, the movie that is, not Women Talking. So that's 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 one dynamic yeah. that we can talk about or not talk about. I'm coming out and saying it, man. Burger King was right. Before I get onto the evils of the movie, Women Talking, I do want to talk about a serious and important issue that the movie addresses. A problem in modern society that damages not just women, but men also, and that this movie was made to at least attempt to mitigate sleep deprivation. According to sleephealth.org, one in three adults do not get the required amount of healthy, uninterrupted sleep. This is why I, the despot, fully endorse women talking as a sedative for anyone having trouble getting a good night's sleep. Women talking is about a group of Mennonite women discussing their future following the revelation that the men of their colony, which I will be calling Patriarchum, have been sexually violating the women and girls of Patriarchum over a period of years. The men achieve this by rendering the women unconscious with cow tranquilizer, violating the comatose victims, then blaming the resulting injuries on ghosts or demons or Satan which the women believe because the men have brainwashed them with a cultish belief system called Christianity. The film never explains how the tranquilizer is administered, how the abuse was able to go on for many years without being discovered, why the men of the colony have descended into psycho sadism, how a group of several hundred men and teenage boys are able to maintain conspiratorial integrity over such a long period of time, why the horrible truth that it was the men all along is a shock to anyone when it is finally revealed. And the critics who collectively gave Women Talking 220 awards nominations would consider it impolite to ask questions like, is the audience seriously expected to believe that of the several hundred male abusers, not one felt guilty and went to the cops or fessed up to his wife or blurted out the truth while drunk or snitched on an enemy who was involved or tried to kill another man for assaulting his daughter or that in the years these men were using cow tranquilizer to render their victims unconscious, no one died of an overdose of a drug that can cause death in humans or that a woman who missed her period a couple of weeks after another demon-induced bout of sudden violence unconsciousness couldn't put one and one together and figure out what was going on or that no woman ever decided to flee patriarchum herself stumbled into a roadside bar collapsed on the floor in a bloody heap and catalyzed the police investigation leading to the total collapse of the colony of course in the social circles of the academy the alliance of women film journalists the critics choice association the golden globes the london film critics circle to name but a few of the organizations that threw awards at women talking considerations of women Talking's story world integrity and logical coherence would be not only rude, but reactionary. Who cares about verisimilitude? Who cares if this movie is about as believable as Jennifer Lawrence's physics PhD? Women are talking. If you can't just shut up, listen, and throw awards at these women when they are finally done talking, then you shouldn't be part of the conversation. You have been invited here. You have been invited here to listen to what we have to say. Nothing more. Just... Listen. You dare to argue with me? Now, Women Talking Stands will no doubt jump to the project's defense by citing that it was based on the true story of Bolivian Mennonite gas facilitated in which a gang of nine men sprayed veterinary gas into houses to render the entire household unconscious, then entered and women, girls, and small children. 
This occurred over a period of five years from 2005 to 2009 and there were a minimum of 151 victims. Women Talking is not based on these events. It is based on a book which is itself inspired by the events. The book is, in the words of its author, Miriam Toes, an act of female imagination. In reality, two members of the Bolivian Mennonite gang were caught breaking and entering and they very quickly gave up the other seven members of the group. The gang was then immediately turned over to Bolivian authorities and they all received lengthy sentences. Today, many houses in that Mennonite community have steel doors and bars on their windows because... Contrary to what is suggested in Women Talking, Mennonite men are actually averse to the idea of their wives and daughters being in their sleep by degenerate vermin. The Bolivian colony has a population of around 2,500. The atrocities were committed by a single group of nine men. In Women Talking, it is not a small gang of criminals committing the abuse. It is the entire male population of Patriarchum. When some guilty men are finally caught and attacked by Patriarchum's women, the colony's men bring the perpetrators to the police not because they want them punished, but for their own protection. Because in Patriarchum, drugging women unconscious and them is... Ah, no big deal, really. As long as the wife doesn't find out about it. Am I right, boys? <laughs> the entire male population go to bail the culprits out. It is not explained why all of Patriarchum's men are required to accomplish this simple task. The script just needs them gone so all the women can talk undisturbed. And the men, bear in mind, the men does not refer to a group comprised of individual men, but rather the Manborg. A Borg-like mass consisting of men. The Manborg quickly or ordains that the women must forgive the and continue living alongside them or be excommunicated from the colony and thus unable to enter heaven in the hereafter. Again, this is a deviation from reality. The Bolivian Mennonite community did not demand total forgiveness of and continued coexistence with the they aggressively pursued their criminal prosecution. Sarah Polly, the writer-director of Women Talking, who is a self-described political activist, deviates from the reality of the Bolivian Mennonite gassing gang crimes as and when it is politically necessary to do so. Instead of a tiny number of men committing the abuse, all the men are committing the abuse since feminism ordains that all men oppress all women. Instead of men being horrified when finding out about the crimes and immediately contacting the authorities, as was the case in reality, the Manborg seeks to cover up the crimes, tries to bail out the culprits immediately when they are caught, and demands that the abusers immediately be allowed back into the colony because... Again, men must be portrayed as a monstrous force of evil that oppresses all women in accordance with the narrative. And if reality interferes with that narrative, reality must be dispensed with. Women Talking is a political propaganda film and nothing else. It is not an attempt to tell a story. There is no story. It's just a group of women sitting in a barn talking. It's not a character study. The nominal characters in this movie are just mouthpieces for feminist talking points. And the one man in the film is a stand-in for what feminism believes modern men should be. Um, may I request that you take it in turns speaking so that I can understand what each of you is saying? It, should God, we put up our hands as though we're children in your schoolhouse? I, I apologize. Let's move on to the cons of leaving. We the women will decide what happens in these meetings. I'm not a two-bit fail farmer who must teach. You have been invited here to listen to what we have to say and write it down. Nothing more. Just listen. I would like to apologize for wrongly attempting to nudge the proceedings. We are all so proud of you. It doesn't matter what I think anyway. <laughs> A weak, pathetic, simpering, whimpering wimp who is easily dominated, does what he's told when he's told by women, of course, and doesn't ask questions. But I'm not here to think. I'm so sorry, Ona. I apologize. I would like to apologize. And who gets laughed at by a woman who looks like Ditto from Pokemon. It's not my place. <laughs> Women
Women Talking is not an attempt to examine the monstrous crimes committed in the Bolivian Mennonite colony. It is much too far removed from the reality of those crimes to be that. Women Talking is a Me Too movie. It is an allegory for how women in Hollywood and women in general should react to the shocking revelation that Hollywood was a den of debauchery and abuse. This movie could just as easily have been nine women sitting in a fashionable restaurant in LA discussing how to react to the revelations that Hollywood was a moral sewer of transactional sex and predatory behaviour. When I reviewed Barbie, I criticised it for being far too political and a propaganda piece for bile-filled man-hating feminism, which is true. And by the way, for those who still think Barbie was a satire of feminism, here is Greta Gerwig, the writer-director, stating that... To give them something other than a tightrope to walk on is how it feels feminist to me. But I think it's also, it's feminist in a way that includes everyone. It's feminist. But Barbie was at least entertaining at times, specifically its first act and Ken's patriarchy. That was wonderful. The entire second act, that is, the part that takes place in the real world, and the ending were awful. But compared to Women Talking, Barbie is an undisputable masterpiece. Women Talking has no interest in entertaining an audience or in presenting anything on screen that could be considered compelling or engaging. It has a message and you will sit there and you will fucking listen to the message throughout all seven hours of its one hour, 44 minute runtime and you will nominate it for awards or else. Now, as much as I despise women talking, I am a fair and just despot. Thus, I will, presently, dedicate a section of this video to discussing the positive aspects of women talking. Right, now that's out of the way, we can proceed. The movie wastes no time in portraying men as a force of evil. The men of the colony are presented not as individuals but as a shadowy, uncanny mass, a faceless abomination, temporarily at rest in its hive of evil, a church. Movies which want to dehumanise the villain often obscure their faces so that they appear not as people but as villainous entities that must be destroyed. There is no word for this technique so I'm going to coin one now. I will call it unfacing. Top Gun famously made extensive use of unfacing. The American soldiers all have cool nicknames like Maverick, Iceman and Goose. You can see the patriotic emotion burn out of their youthful eyes when they're airborne and they have cool 80s haircuts and thirst trapped beach bodies. The Russian pilots have none of these things. They have no personality, no names, no cool haircuts, they have no faces. They are simply the other, the enemy. The contrast between the all-American goodness of the Top Gun pilots and the faceless evil of the visor-helmeted Russian pilots is one of the many elements that make Top Gun one of the most successful propaganda movies of all time. And don't get me wrong, I love Top Gun. You can be my wingman anytime. Bullshit. You can be mine. Yeah. but it would be naive to deny its immense value as military propaganda. After the movie was released, US Navy recruitment increased 500%. The US military lent the production four aircraft carriers, 24 F-14 Tomcats, F-5 Tigers and A-4 Skyhawks, some of which were flown by real-life Top Gun pilots and allowed the production to film in Miramar Naval Air Station all for the token price of $1.8 million, a sum of money that wouldn't even have covered the cost of operating one aircraft carrier for one day. Star Wars uses unfacing to portray stormtroopers, the TIE fighter pilots, and Darth Vader as the bad guys. The Lord of the Rings does it with Sauron, and James Bond did it in From Russia With Love, never showing Blofeld's face. The housebroken wimp, August, is the only man, if you'll call him a man, whose face is shown up close in women talking. Polly also deploys the Manborg element, which I discuss in my video about Gillette's infamous 2019 ad, The Best Men Can Be. The Manborg element is a modern propaganda technique in which the men on screen are all made to look as identical as possible in order to portray them as constituent elements of a single patriarchal leviathan and to 
suggest that all men are the same vessel of vile toxicity. In the Manborg frame in Women Talking, the men wear near identical clothing. The stodgy cinematography's excessive colour desaturation makes their clothes look even more similar. Every man holds the exact same pose, bent over in prayer with his head buried in the bend of his right arm, hands joined, fingers interlocked, right arm resting horizontally across the prayer bench. There are also visual elements that are designed to communicate sameness. Above the Manborg, identical beige straw hats hang from a hat rack, and at the back of the room, four near identical chairs are placed with their backs to the wall. This is the only time in Women Talking that the audience will see the villain, the Manborg, which is of course a stand-in for the patriarchy. There are a few other shots in the movie of men shown at a distance or manhandling women, but Polly is careful not not to humanise them by showing their faces close up. There are many shots of boys in the movie in which they are depicted as feral, wild, dangerous, angry and untrustworthy. Shots of the boys will always be accompanied by ominous music pregnant with the danger these animals pose to women. A way of seeing the world in us women which has been allowed to take hold of men's hearts and minds. Early in the movie we learn that the girls of Patriarchum are not taught to read. Girls in our colony had very little schooling. We hardly knew how to read or to write. In spite of their illiteracy, they speak like this. Please forgive my mother for using the wrong word. It's a sin so outrageous that Salome has taken it upon herself to rectify for the sake of all humanity. Perhaps forgiveness can, in some instances, be confused with permission. But wait, aren't you suggesting that the attackers are as much victims as the victims of the attacks? That all of us, men and women, are victims of the circumstances from which the colony has been created? There are even scenes showing women quote the Bible verbatim. Women Talking contradicts itself on the point of female illiteracy in Patriarchum. This woman is quoting the Bible, a book which she isn't supposed to be able to read because she can't read because patriarchy. It's possible that parts of the Bible were taught to her orally in church, but the movie hasn't bothered to address this. Instead, it simply asserts that these women are systematically deprived of education by the patriarchy. They have been so thoroughly robbed of an education by evil men that they can't even write their own names, and yet they are able to form complex abstract thoughts, conceptualize and articulate metaphysical conundrums. We do not need to be forgiven by the men of God for protecting our children from the depraved actions of vicious men who are often the very same men we're meant to ask for forgiveness. If God is a loving God, then he will forgive us himself. If God is a vengeful God, then he has created us in his image. If God is omnipotent, then why has he not protected the women and girls of this colony? Women talking is logically incoherent. It wants to depict women as victims of men who are so oppressed from birth that not a single woman in the colony can read, but at the same time portrays them as highly intelligent, thoughtful and articulate. Film, you can't have it both ways. Pick one. Either the women are uneducated, illiterate, inarticulate and thus struggle with abstractions, or they are well educated, literate, articulate and proficient in abstract thought. Of course Women Talking does not choose because Women Talking is written by feminism, and feminism believes that all women are innately brilliant and only prevented from self-actualizing as high-powered CEOs and STEM geniuses by the patriarchy. <laughs> People who don't read sound like this. Just like the fact of just like, you like, I don't know how to word this. Like in like talking stages and it's just like you're like labeled that and it's like people like are considered like, you can't like, you're just like confused. And people who can't read sound like this. I just want to give y'all my take on it coming from a black girl and um like, well, first of all, I'm not taking nobody's culture because I'm black, honey. But Give me all my take. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so. They don't sound like this. We do not need to be forgiven by the men of God 
for protecting our children from the depraved actions of vicious men who are often the very same men were meant to ask for forgiveness. Women Talking's characters are not characterised according to a realistic understanding of how women who have been raised illiterate in ultra-zealous religious cultures behave, think and talk. They are puppets which Polly uses as mouthpieces to express her own political ideology. We have been preyed upon like animals. Even the animals are safer in their homes than we women are. All we have are our dreams. So of course we're dreamers. We know that we are bruised and infected. A way of seeing the world in us women which has been allowed to take hold of men's hearts and minds. Bear in mind, as I'm explaining the paucity of characterization, ludicrously implausible dialogue, and total absence of a logically coherent story world, this movie won Best Adapted Screenplay at the Critics' Choice Awards, the Writers Guild of America Awards, and the Oscars. Is it possible that these organisations have become politicised to the point where they are no longer giving out awards based solely on merit, and that massive favour will be given to movies which propagandise the kinds of political messages the establishment wants propagandised? I've also been thinking about the verse from Philippians. Of course you have, because illiterate people tend to dwell on the significance of literary excerpts. It was interesting to think about it psychologically as well, because I've read student papers that were of the same ilk in some sense, although I'm not suggesting that they were of the same level of glittering literary brilliance and polemic quality. And I also understand that the Communist Manifesto was a call for revolution and not a standard logical argument. And by the way, neither Mennonite nor Amish communities impose illiteracy on women, and never have. Girls are educated to the same standard as boys in those communities. We know that we've been attacked by men. This is just one example of how phony the dialogue in this movie is. We know we have been attacked by men. No one speaks like this. No one. Least of all, a Mennonite woman who has not been brainwashed into viewing the world through the feminist lens of gender dichotomy. Men and women not as complementary halves of the human species, but as opposing power groups in competition with one another. Also note that this woman is not using names here. She's not saying Edna was attacked by Eli, or Abigail was attacked by Noah and Samuel. She's speaking about men and women as collectives. No one would talk about attacks that went on in a close-knit community they'd lived in their entire life in these highly abstracted, almost academic terms. It's weird, it's unnatural, and it's politically motivated. Rachel, what do you think of this dialogue? Weird. Weird. Indeed. This is just bad dialogue, and the entire movie sounds like this. We know that we are bruised. We know that we must protect our children regardless of who is guilty. This was very much the logic of the Me Too movement. Men's individual guilt, or lack thereof, was largely irrelevant. Women needed to be protected from men, and so any time a man went down, particularly a powerful man, that was a good thing. Considerations of innocence and guilt were reactionary, because believe all women. Do not call me a liar. Because everything that I had said to date and everything I've said to date now is the truth. It is possible the men in prison are not guilty of the attacks, but are they guilty of not stopping the attacks? Again, Me Too logic. Even if an accused man is not guilty of the specific crimes of which he is accused, he is guilty of failing to advocate for women, or at the very least of having some vague notion that something might have been going on and not going out of his way to somehow do something about it. And so any and all punishment he receives is justified. The allegory element is being pushed very aggressively here. In this scene, these women are clearly not characters in a movie talking about assaults that took place on their Mennonite community. They're middle class American feminists in Mennonite dresses talking about the Me Too movement and Hollywood culture of transactional sex and sexual predation. By the way, women cannot be held accountable for inaction in the midst of an abuse culture, because when a woman makes a Faustian pact with Hollywood, that means that it is not illegal. Throughout the entire barn conversation, a man's name is never used in the third person. The women only ever refer to the men or men. 
This hammy, clumsy, phony dialogue is simultaneously awful to listen to and dehumanising toward men. But Polly doesn't care. Her goal is to strengthen the Manborg element, the perception that all men are a single mass of villainous toxicity, and emphasise the allegorical nature of the conversation as much as possible. Subtlety is clearly not Sarah Polly's strong point. Another problem with the women never using the men's names is that it just adds to the un reality of the movie, a group of women discussing years long attacks carried out against them would be discussing husbands, brothers and sons, wondering if they were involved and if they'll be punished. The dialogue is bad not just because it's clunky, unnatural and forced, but also because it's completely unrealistic. We do know that the conditions have been created by men and that these attacks have been made possible because of the circumstances of the colony. Now we don't even have to worry about guilt, guilt by association or guilt by inaction. Now, any man who had anything to do with creating these conditions in Hollywood, whatever the hell that means, is guilty. You know what, let's just round up all men and put them in concentration camps. There, problem solved. By the way, needless to say, women get a free pass on their part in creating the Weinsteinian conditions of Hollywood. Why? Uh, uh, because... Uh, th um, like, well... The lesson of power. They have taught the lesson of power to the boys and men of the colony, and the boys and men have been excellent students. You see what I'm saying? That's why. Also, because it's women, and when women are involved in creating conditions in which sexual degeneracy thrives. That means that it is not illegal. And those circumstances have been created and ordained by the men. Yes, we get it. All men guilty, no need for a trial. But wait, aren't you suggesting that the attackers are as much victims as the victims of the attacks. That all of us, men and women, are victims of the circumstances from which the colony has been created. This is a highly abstract web of thoughts. Is Polly seriously suggesting that a woman who can't read I just want to give y'all my take on it coming from a black girl would be capable of forming this barely comprehensible word salad of abstract feminisms? But again, don't question it, just give it an award or two, 120. It's the elder's quest for power that is responsible. Because they needed to have those. Those they'd have power over. And those people are us. And they have taught the lesson of power to the boys and men of the colony, and the boys and men have been excellent students. This is Feminism 101. Again, not something a Mennonite woman is likely to say, since I don't think she was present when Sarah Polly was sitting through the Lesson of Power seminar at some fashionable Silicon Valley event that had Elizabeth Holmes as the keynote speaker. I believe the individual is the answer to the challenges of healthcare. I could go into detail about why this line And they have taught the lesson of power to the boys and men of the colony and the boys and men have been excellent students. Is such an appalling piece of dialogue. But if I stop to criticize this movie every time a character excretes an absolute clunker of a line, by the time you finally look up from your phone, you will see the four horsemen of the apocalypse outside your window. Instead, I am just going to play the line again, followed by a subtle hint of what I think of it. Pay close attention and you might catch the hint. And they have taught the lesson of power to the boys and men of the colony, and the boys and men have been excellent students. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. The assertion itself is so nebulous that it's difficult to respond to, but the core of it is, quite simply, that men hold power over women, they abuse that power, they teach boys to do the same, and boys embrace their role as the next generation of the patriarchy with great eagerness. I could send this video down a rabbit hole explaining that the average man has next to no power and influence, and very little wealth, if any at all beyond his wage slave stipend. Not every man is Patrick Bateman, despite what feminism thinks. But I already explained all of this in detail and with lots of evidence and statistics and examples in my Barbie video. The link to that video is in the description. Now, back to the superhuman test of endurance that is women talking. This is very, very boring. boring.
thing! Next, our boy August gives his two cents about this whole let's get together and talk about how much we hate men, caper. I mean, it doesn't matter what I think anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. Men aren't supposed to have opinions in current year. Next, we get a little anecdote just to remind the viewer how lazy, selfish, and useless men are. I have to give a little me for antibiotics. Where did you get antibiotics? She walked. She walked for a day and a half to the mobile clinic with Meep on her back. Wait, this makes no sense. Of course her father and elder brothers can't be relied on to look after her daughter, and you can't ask one of the men to drive a horse carriage into town to pick up the antibiotics, because men are useless layabouts. And the men would definitely leave with us because they can't survive without us. Well, not for longer than a day or we two. Have not also, men don't do nice things, but couldn't this woman have asked her mother or one of her sisters to look after Meep while she went off for the antibiotics? Or maybe one of Meep's older sisters, or a female friend, or a niece, or cousin, or neighbour, or sister-in-law, rather than walk for a day and a half with a sick child on your back? Sarah Polly has constructed this little anecdote so she can show a harrowing visual of a woman determined to take care of her sick daughter in spite of the male indifference and uselessness that she is surrounded by. But Polly hasn't stopped for even a second to consider that maybe this doesn't make sense, that this heart-wrenching little anecdote is just plain and simple shit writing, but hey, never let a bad story get in the way of a good narrative. Despite being set in a Mennonite colony, Women Talking manages to make room for some trans positive messaging. Is she always going to be like this now? Like what? A man. Is Nettie always going to be a man now? Later, we understood that Nettie didn't become a man because of what happened. Nettie had never felt like a woman. Now pretending had become impossible. Thank you, Melvin. Saying my name. The film here asserts that if a biological female believes that she is a male, her not presenting a superficial image to the world that is stereotypically associated with men constitutes pretending to be a woman. Let me rephrase that because it is a bit confusing. A biological female can now pretend to be a woman. <sighs> Moth. You may fire when ready. <laughs> Needless to say, whatever your opinion of transgenderism is, I think we can all agree that transgender ideology is not likely to penetrate the socially, linguistically, culturally, and technologically isolated confines of a Mennonite colony. By the way, this is a society of religious fanatics that engage in organized sexual predation and violent abuse against all the women of the colony, but they don't seem to have any problem at all with transgenderism. But who cares? Never let bad writing get in the way of good messaging. Quick note for anyone wondering what I mean when I say American Mennonites are linguistically isolated. They speak their own language, a dialect of Dutch called Pennsylvania Dutch, which is also spoken by the Amish. Its absence in the movie is not an issue since the use of English in the movie is non-diegetic, meaning not occurring within the world of the narrative. In world, they are speaking Dutch, but this is rendered into non-diegetic English for the benefit of the audience. This is also the reason I did not criticize the use of American English in my recent video about Ridley Scott's Napoleon. You think you're so great because you have boats! Next, this already appalling film reaches its low point, its portrayal of teenage boys as predators. Is my brother listening? Hello, little brother. I don't know if the baby was yours or if it was one of your friends. This demonization of boys runs throughout the movie. This is one of the more blunt instances of it and sets the stage for what follows. Well, I went to university so I could serve a purpose and teach the boys. Do you wait. Our freedom and safety are the ultimate goals. And it is men who prevent us from achieving those goals. A way of seeing the world and us women which has been allowed to take hold of men's hearts and minds. Look at the way the boys are visually portrayed here, the camera zooming right in on their face like it's interrogating their soul, the director making her best attempt to plaster on a shame-faced gaze. You know what this reminds me of? Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? 
The framing of the boys' faces here is so emotionally and visually brutalist that you could just swap out the visuals in the Gillette ad for the scene of the schoolboys and women talking and it would have the exact same intended effect. Bullying. The Me Too the movement against sexual toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? Both the Gillette commercial and Women Talking depict young boys as vessels of toxicity that can only be prevented from exploding into an acidic rage of sexual violence with the alkaline cure of feminine passivity. It was all waiting to happen before it happened. In this scene, the boys are standing on a haystack, elevated above the girls. This is a visual metaphor for how society places men above women and boys above girls. You could look back and follow the breadcrumbs along the path that led to violence. When we looked back, we could see that it had been everywhere. This is an absolutely despicable despicable assertion that sexually predatory behaviour in men is a direct result of how boys are brought up in modern society and that the only way to stop this behaviour is to ruthlessly stomp masculinity out of the boys from the youngest possible age. When we looked back, we could see that it had been everywhere, whether it was happening yet or not. Use of the word it here is deliberately vague but supposed to relate to sexual abuse. The assertion here is that when boys are at play, especially boyish rough and tumble play or roughhousing, they are engaged in sexual violence against women because the inevitable end point of boys at play is male sexual predation. This same diseased strain of feminist thought is present in the Gillette ad in which boys are reprimanded for wrestling on grass. But some is not enough. So how we treat each other, okay? Long-term impacts of play deprivation during early child development include isolation, depression, reduced self-control and poor resilience. Educators, parents and policymakers should all be concerned at the rapid decline in unsupervised free play for children, which may damage early child development and later social and emotional learning, according to research. It's good that you're here, August to remind us of what's possible. August is an example of how men can be cured of their inherent evil if they abandon all authority, power and masculinity and meekly submit to female authority. Sorry. Would you just write it down under prose? There is hope for men in submission. It's not my place. <laughs> Aaron is just over 12, just barely. Why would boys of 13 and 14 be left behind? Why wouldn't they leave with us? Surely we don't have to be afraid of the boys of this age. August, you're the boys' teacher. What is your feeling about this? This is what happens when you allow your mind to be consumed by the absolute fucking poison that is identity politics. You believe it is perfectly legitimate to suggest women should isolate themselves from 13-year-old boys because those boys might them. The women in Women Talking do not speak of men as individuals. The men, even the little boys, barely into puberty. All of them are nothing more than constituent elements of the Manborg that poses an inexorable and permanent danger to women. It is not the individual man, the criminal degenerate, who poses a threat to women. It is all men and any boy who has begun to acquire adult male physical traits. And what does our boy August say when asked if 13 year old children pose a risk to women? Do boys of that age pose a risk to our girls and women? Does he say, what the fuck have you mad harpies been smoking? Are you seriously considering abandoning teenage children because you have determined that their male nature makes them a threat to you? Bear in mind, you haven't even bothered taking into consideration the behaviour of individual boys. You just lump them all into a single category and demand that totalitarian judgement be levelled against them as a group. How about this? Put down whatever hallucinogenic demon weed you have been hoofing into your lungs and start talking sense, you deranged hags. What does our boy say in response to... Do boys of that age pose a risk to our girls and women? 
Yes. Because of course he fucking does. He then proceeds to launch into a pseudoscientific breakdown of the traits of teenage man cattle. Boys of 13 or 14 are capable of causing great damage to girls and women. It is a brash age. They are possessed of reckless urges and not quite enough experience or brain development to fully understand or appreciate the consequences of their words or actions. They're tall, muscular, sexually inquisitive creatures with little impulse control. Yes, women talking refers to teenage boys as creatures. They're tall, muscular, sexually inquisitive creatures. This clip of boys at play, once again, is accompanied by ominous music. They are possessed of reckless urges, physical exuberance, intense Hey, you know what? Let's dress this nature production up a bit. Can we bring David Attenborough in on this? A herd of man cattle is at play. At first they appear jovial, but underneath this seemingly frivolous display of camaraderie lies a deep impulse for destruction. As individual members of the herd mature, they will take on the aggressive, violent and brutal behaviors of the pack leaders, the men. Once mature, these man cattle will be absorbed into the manborg, from whence they will wreak a savage destruction upon womankind. Only through thorough animal training can their impulse for violence that manifests as toxic masculinity and aggression against women be safely eradicated. But they are children. They're children and they can be taught. The assertion here is that wild, feral teenage boys will, unless utterly domesticated and purged of their toxic masculinity become violent predators that endanger women. Ricky, are you not afraid that your own sweet boys will become monsters? I could search the farthest reaches of my mind in an attempt to find the words necessary to express my total disgust for women talking's treatment of teenage boys, but not being a wordsmith of Shakespeare level genius, I would inevitably fail in that endeavour. Instead, I invite you to attempt to articulate the wrongs, or rights if you agree with it, of Women Talking's portrayal of male children. They're tall, muscular, sexually inquisitive creatures. Ricky, are you not afraid that your own sweet boys will become monsters? Creatures. Monsters. Do boys of that age pose a risk to our girls and women? Yes. Monsters, 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 monsters. Hello, little brother. I don't know if the baby was yours, or if it was... One of your friends. Monsters, monsters, monsters. Boys of 13 or 14 are capable of causing great damage to girls and women. Monsters, monsters, monsters. Please leave your thoughts in the comments. Here's another visual metaphor. The fence between the woman and the herdling symbolizes the eternal divide that exists between the sexes. But women can, if they try to get through to these creatures at a young enough age, perhaps allow them to glimpse the enlightenment of the female side of the fence that all women are naturally born into. Every boy under 15 and the ones who need special care must accompany the women. Well, that settles that. No discussion needed. Get fucked, 15-year-old boys, you disgusting gang of violent savages. Your own sweet boys will become monsters. The male hurdling is nearing the age of physical maturity. It has reached 15 years. Soon, this creature will complete its transformation into an apex predator, a man. Its daily existence is now a violent rampage of plunder and violence. Its mind never strays far from the damage it seeks to inflict on any woman unfortunate enough to stumble into its hunting grounds. Our freedom and safety are the ultimate goals. And it is men who prevent us from achieving those goals. I... <sighs> I've watched this movie twice. I, um... I know. You don't have to say the words. If I were married, I wouldn't be myself. So the person you love would be gone. Let's really examine this statement. If I were married, I wouldn't be myself. So the person you love would be gone. The idea is that self-actualization can only be attained in isolation of others. The application of this same feminist principle in Barbie was what led to the gaping emptiness that was that movie's ending. When Ken gets Ken zoned by Barbie and Barbie, after a conversation with a random old lady nobody gives a shit about, becomes a strong, independent woman who don't need no man and won't be making TikToks five years from now about how much she regrets turning down Ken. I feel unbelievably betrayed by feminism. I was constantly fed this idea that 
Women can do everything. We don't really need men. Women can be anything. By the way, Greta Gerwig, if you're listening, please make a sequel where Ken has become a happily married father and Barbie is living in a state of panic as she stirs down the barrel of a lonely cat lady existence. Feminists believe that a woman married is a woman diluted. The idea that a woman ceases to be her true self when she gets married is an argument against all love and marriage. If a man loves a woman, he loves her as her strong, independent self. If he marries her, the woman he fell in love with is subsumed within the chains of marriage and presence of her husband. Therefore, all marriage is the end of love. True love can only exist between a man and a woman outside the shackles of marriage during the brief love buzz period period before either of the two begin to change in any significant way. To suggest that a change in a woman's marital status is sufficient to end all feelings of love a man has for her is to assert that love itself is a small, temporal, anemic force that shatters as soon as it meets an object of resistance. And what does our boy August say in response? Does he say, sorry love, but that's complete horseshit. A man does not love a woman because of her life circumstances. He loves her for her appearance, personality, behaviour, conversation, humour and countless other traits, both physical and abstract, that are beyond counting and even comprehension. And as to the idea that you would not be yourself if you were married, what the fuck are you talking about, you clueless bitch? Would you be someone else? Would you, upon marriage, morph into a man-shaped, baldy, grey-skinned, noseless horror? Perhaps you would transform into an anime villain that looks like a cross between a starved hippo and that dildo that sold out after Grinding Nemo won the Oscar for hottest aqua porn. Your life circumstances are not your identity. A married woman today does not transform into a different person when she is officially divorced tomorrow. As much as our corporate overlords would like us to believe that our identities are inextricably bound to our present circumstances, a wage slaving, tax paying, single rent surf will never be anything but and must never Ever ask for better, that is not the case, and love is a force which transcends all. To quote Shakespeare, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Honey. Now, I don't know what mad shit those batshit wenches have been smoking in that barn, but stay away from it and get me some. So what does our boy say when presented with this woman's almost inconceivably stupid statement? If I were married, I wouldn't be myself. So the person you love would be gone. He says... <laughs> Nothing. He just meekly accepts it like the good little, well-trained, domesticated, current year man that he is. He knows his place. It's not my place. When a woman says something, no matter how insane or mind-bendingly idiotic it is, he shuts his mouth and nods along. You have been invited here to listen to what we have to say and write it down. Nothing more. I would like to apologize. In this scene, a girl is drawing a boy and his mother, but she has not yet gotten round to drawing the boy's head. The headless boy symbolizes the dangerous animal nature of boys. They are not fully human. They are undeveloped. August even makes reference to their lack of brain development. And not quite enough experience or brain development to fully understand or appreciate the consequences of their words or actions. It's also another subtle use of unfacing. In this case, it's deployed subliminally to plant the idea in the viewer's mind that boys are less than human. This is preparatory to August's assertion later in the movie that teenage boys are a kind of feral animal that need to be domesticated, housebroken and taught not to abuse women before it's too late. The men should leave with us if they wish. Then what on earth is the point of us leaving? Well, they could be allowed to join the women later once the women have established themselves and are thriving. Yes, if only men would go away, women would be thriving. Just like they thrived recently on the first all-female spacewalk, when, in the absence of the oppressive presence of men, the female astronauts lost a $100,000 tool bag, which is currently orbiting the Earth as an artificial satellite and has been given the designation Object 1998067WC. And the men would definitely leave with us because they can't survive without us. Well, not for longer than a day or we two. Have not yes, thank God men have women to build our roads, keep the shit flowing through the sewers, take away the trash, fight our enemies in war, man our power stations. I mean, 
woman our power stations, transport food throughout the country, perform complex spacewalks, and do just about every shitty job that requires hard physical labour that there is. Truly, we would be lost without them. Shortly after this, Ditto has a panic attack as flashes of the abuse she has suffered sear through her mind, though I do not know what man in his right mind, even under the influence of alcohol, would f I don't know about those things, except for love and... Even love is mysterious to me. What do you mean love is mysterious to you? Five minutes ago you were telling my boy August that he won't love you if you're no longer single, suggesting that you believe yourself to have a fairly thorough understanding of love? You Hold on. Was this girl just making shit up to fob off our boy when he made his play? You wee c- I want to tell another story about Ruth- No, no, please. No story. How about, instead of a story, you don't tell a story? That way, this film can be over sooner? I was always frightened of the Northern Road out of- This is very, very boring. There's so many gullies on either side of- SO FUCKING BORING! Next, a man appears. He's right outside. And chilling music filled with the threat of man rises up to alert the audience of his presence. <gasps> he has Ruth and Cheryl. That man is sick! Groundskeeper Willie saved you, Homer! But listen to the music, he's evil! So the women decide to leave the colony. They run around telling all the other women that they will all be leaving tomorrow, so pack your shit and be there. The male hurdling stews in a deep sexual frustration, his toxic male energy ready to explode violently onto the women, targets at which he aims his hungry, feral gaze. A female relative tries to calm the creature, but it is no good. The hurdling rushes to the window and watches, hoping to spy fresh prey upon whom to slake its primal urges. So in the end, the women all head off to get away from the evils of man and to find the world's first all-female Mennonite colony, Beth Lesbahem. Women Talking's cinematography is trash. The colour palette is heavily desaturated to visually emphasise the misery that these women live through and it just makes an already very boring movie even more difficult to endure because the naturally vibrant, beautiful colours of the agricultural area the movie is set in have been drained out, leaving a sterile, dreary visual environment dominated by bleak, dark greys. The film just looks like the cinematographer dipped the whole thing in greyish mud. This is a perfect example of one note cinematography. There's no use of contrast or cinematographic variety or development over time to denote different aspects of the movie's thematic spectrum, such as characters basking in the beautiful glow of warm summer sunshine to symbolise hope breaking through darkness. There is simply no directorial subtlety, skill or craft here. The themes and messages of the movie are blunt, ham-fisted and brutal. Sarah Polly's direction of this movie is the cinematic equivalent of a full frontal assault on an enemy position in battle. She just deploys everything she has at her disposal in the same direction, forward, to communicate the themes and messages of her propaganda piece. We need to have shots of a teenage girl who has been by her younger brother smearing blood up against the wall and shots of victims waking up bloody from an attack and an old woman who's just had her teeth knocked out and women screeching at men and close-up shots of young boys looking feral and vaguely psychotic in order to communicate their toxic masculinity and women crying and a woman showing up in a sling with a battered face next to her bruised daughter and a woman screaming and conversations about the dangers posed to women by 13 year old boys but all that not being quite enough to sledgehammer the viewer in the face with the message that men are bad and women are victims. We have to swamp the whole thing in a fuck ugly anti-colour palette to drain every bit of visual vibrancy out of this steaming pile of shite. Jesus man, we fucking get it. Men bad, women victims. This movie is about as subtle as Quentin Tarantino's foot fetish. My god man, what an absolutely magnificent purr of ears Quentin Tarantino has. 
just spectacular. Compare this with The Shawshank Redemption, another movie about a character finding strength and seeking freedom in the midst of a torturous imprisonment. The Shawshank Redemption doesn't turn every single element of the movie over to smashing the viewer upside the head with the misery of Andy's imprisonment and drowning the whole thing in depression inducing darkness. The narrative communicates Andy's circumstances and the rich colour palette gives everything a sense of place and location. The dusty air, the yellow summer sunshine and fine rich brown dirt gives the movie a clear sense of place, of geographic identity and, bonus point, it's actually pleasant to look at, unlike this quagmire of visual slime. There are aspects of women talking that are okay, namely the casting, acting and music, but there really is nothing to recommend the film. The acting is fine, but the actresses on screen are caricaturish puppets spouting out clunky dialogue. We do not need to be forgiven by the men of God for protecting our children from the depraved actions of vicious men who are often the very same men were meant to ask for forgiveness. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. This added to the forced melodrama the director demands of the actresses means that the actresses, however talented and experienced they may be, simply don't have the material to put across strong, compelling performances. The dialogue is not only clunky, but unnatural, boring, and filled with modern feminist ideas that Mennonite women not plugged into the machine would never say. And they have taught the lesson of power to the boys and men of the colony and the boys and men have been excellent students. He was in the Amazon with my mom. The cinematography is sophomoric, film school level bad. Oh dude, so like cause this place with all the chicks is like fucking depressing and shit, so the movie should look really dark, you know? Oh man, that's so amazing, bro. I know, right? The movie has no internal coherence. It's filled with plot holes and lacks believability. Illiterate women who are also highly articulate. A years-long conspiracy of psychosexual abuse that goes unchallenged and undiscovered despite the participation of hundreds of men and boys and the abuse of many women and girls. A religious community in the USA in 2010 that illegally deprives girls of an education. A transgender teen in a Mennonite community that is culturally and technologically isolated from the rest of the country and would not even comprehend the notion of transgenderism. This community imposes illiteracy on girls who they refuse to educate, but they're fine with transgenderism. <laughs> live and let live, bro. The abusers are taken to jail not because the other men want them punished, but for their own protection. But this makes no sense. If the men's only motivation in removing the abusers was to protect them from the vengeance of the women, why not just drive them to a motel a few miles away? All the men convinced leave Patriarchum to go bail out their homeboy because the script needs them gone and later when the women need more time to sit in a barn and talk because you know cinematic spectacle the script makes the men need to stay in town longer to bail out their boy why does the posting of bail require hundreds of men and several days the one good man is presented as conscientious but he never went to the police at any point in the past to report the abuse he clearly knew was going on being that he's a man and all and the other men would have tried to get him in on the action at some point. Several men have been arrested in Patriarchum for sexual assault. Why have no police come to carry out a forensic investigation or to interview any of the town's residents? Women talking makes no sense. Women talking does not, either in its premise or the oppressive world of Patriarchum that Polly has manufactured, bear any resemblance to reality. The staged, political narrative driven rendering of women talking was the main point of criticism leveled at the movie by the one critic who had the balls to call bullshit on this mess. Out of all the critic reviews posted on Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes, quote, It's mannered in its conception and wooden in its execution and has little to do with living, breathing people. Women talking does not work as an allegory of real world sexism, patriarchy, female oppression or victimhood or any one of the many and ever increasing myriad cornucopia of feminist buzzwords because it is fundamentally a lie. The film is a straw man for the feminist world view. All men bad, all women victims, all teenage boys toxic and in urgent need of extensive animal training. By the way, the aforementioned review is excellent. There's a link to it in the description if you want to read it in full. But I do want to include the final paragraph here. Karen iPhone. Polly begins the movie with the opening title. What follows is an act of female imagination, a lofty assertion that, in effect, blames the movie on all women. It's not fair. 
One should not blame a whole gender for one's own failure of imagination. And the movie drags. It is space-time distortingly dragging. If a group of people entered a theatre and watched this movie on a loop for 10 years, they would emerge to find that 50 years had passed outside the theatre while they were in watching it. None of those criticisms have anything to do with politics. Before you even get to the disgusting misandry and ideologically driven demonization of boys as young as 13, women talking is already a very bad movie. Cinematography, writing, dialogue, believability, internal coherence, characterization, direction, delivery of themes and messages, and basic entertainment value range in quality from poor to awful. And yet, Women Talking received 220 awards nominations and won 82. To put that into perspective, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, an outstanding movie released the same year as Women Talking, received 42 awards nominations. Spider-Man No Way Home received 60 nominations. Top Gun Maverick received 183. Tar, a little known but very good film starring Kate Blanchett, received 193. 2019's Sound of Metal, one of my favourite movies of the past five years, received 45 nominations. And Morbius received five nominations. Women Talking was out-nominated by Everything Everywhere All at Once, which got 405 nominations. Everything Everywhere All at Once is a fine movie, but I hated the ending in which the mass-murdering villain, Jobu Tupaki, is given a pass because she's a woman. And when a woman wantonly murders vast numbers of innocent people in an attempt to turn the multiverse into a nihilistic hellscape... That means that it is not illegal. Women Talking is emotional blackmail. It is victimist cinema. Parade a group of victims before the camera and demand that the audience applaud. And if they don't applaud, they refuse to stand with victims. She said, another Me Too movie, did the exact same thing. The movie features scene after scene after scene of harrowed victims relating their tales of victimhood. Harvey wanted people to submit to him. And if they didn't? Well, then he'd roar. I am so glad that movie bombed. I mean, no offence or anything, Carrie. Fuck you! The most heavy-handed example of this kind of emotional blackmail in Women Talking is this scene. The scene shows a beaten mother and daughter, savaged by a man, striking out to escape the evils of patriarchy. What professional critic would, after seeing that scene, dare stand against the movie? What critic could stand against it without suffering severe career damage? The Screen Actors Guild panel are discussing the merits of this brave and stunning film, Women Talking. For 15 minutes, the conversation has revolved around the magnificent portrayal of abused women, how all men need to see this masterpiece, how men need to see themselves reflected back at themselves in this unflinching portrait of the consequences of toxic masculinity. Reflection of myself, reflection of myself, reflection of myself, reflection of myself. The panel emphasized the importance of women talking, how this is a modern day Philadelphia. It's to kill a mockingbird? It's this generation's Shawshank redemption. Suddenly, a critic stands up, a male critic, a white male critic, and proceeds with the following criticism. Excuse me, but while I admire the goals of the filmmakers in tackling important subjects such as domestic and sexual abuse, I feel that there is no nuance to the movie. It's much too heavy handed in its messaging and characterization. Internal coherence and plot are all clearly subservient to the political imperatives of the director and secondary to the requirements of the script. I am also not comfortable with the portrayal of teenage boys as potential sexual predators, particularly the description of them as creatures. All that aside, this is an excruciatingly boring film, and I was struggling to stay awake during it. Do you think that expressing such an opinion might have an adverse effect on that critic's career? Will this critic, who dared to question a film that gave victims the space they need to stand in their truth, see career opportunities diminish over the course of the next few weeks and months? Will he be invited back onto the Screen Actors Guild panel in future? 
Out of 47 critic reviews on Metacritic, only one is unfavorable from the San Francisco Chronicle. But what else can you expect from a bastion of far-right MAGA maniacs like San Francisco? Empire fat nip. It's MAGA country. And on Rotten Tomatoes, every critic review is positive. By presenting criticism of all men from the perspective of beaten women, the movie uses the power of victimhood to force the viewer onto the side of those women, and thus into agreement with the film's narrative that men and boys are dangerous and abusive, and only the most timid, meek, weak, pathetic and submissive among them can be tolerated. And if you disagree with the messages of this movie, if you dare express any doubt as to the quality of this movie, you don't stand with abused women. You offer no support for victims. Not only are you not helping to address the problem, you're part of the problem. Simple and effective, at least at getting movies nominated for awards. Of course, no one actually goes to see this victimist garbage. Women Talking made a grand total of $9 million at the box office, and she said made less than $14 million, and was one of the biggest wide-release box office bombs of all time. But total popular indifference and complete cultural irrelevance aside, establishment critics and regime-affiliated awards organizations had no no choice. They had to praise this incoherent shite to the rafters and shire it in awards because it came out at what turned out to be the tail end of the Me Too witch hunt. Any critic who criticised women talking or victimist cinema generally would have fallen suspect of heresy and witchcraft and possibly seen their career go up in flames as they were burned at the stake. Conversely, nominating trash like women talking for awards was a good way of demonstrating that you were an ally, you were against the abuse of women, and the witch hunters need not turn their gaze toward you. The result was that an absolutely terrible film, Women Talking, was nominated for 220 awards and ended up winning 82. Oh my grande no whip white chocolate mocha 5 pump extra shot soy macchiato. You are giving off some serious not at all low key incel vibes here. Tell me you hate women without telling me you hate women. Okay, let's unpack this. Women Talking is a brave and stunning portrait of abused non-men, horribly victimized by an oppressive patriarchal white male Christian dominance structure, which, as a white person, I fully endorse for- Non-playable sheep, I really don't want to spend any more time discussing women talking. Whatever your objections- you know what? How about we talk about a fun movie? What about Tetris? You want to talk about Tetris? Tetris is a celebration of the white male dominated dominance hierarchy, which perpetuates dangerous. Thanks for listening. Subscribe and don't forget to victimize the like button. heteronormative exclusion culture. It features only minimal female screen time, during which the non men present are contextualized within a framework of white male expectation which perpetuates dangerous stereotypes of non-men's place in the Western dominance hierarchy. The exclusion of LGBTQIAP2 plus characters, persons of size, and the marginalization of bodies of color into roles only nominally substitutive for people of power in a contemporary white adjacent hostile space constructed with within the framework of the masculine gaze.